So gentlemen, yesterday we went over the story of the marriage between Tobiah and Sarah. And we talked about what enabled Tobiah to survive while Sarah's previous seven husbands had died. And of course what we pointed to was uh, prayer. And in that prayer, Tobiah and Sarah alluded to the original purpose of marriage, which was of course to see the other, the spouse, as a call to make a loving gift of self. That sort of view toward marriage is life-giving, and thus Tobias survives. What I'd also like you to do over the weekend, um, as you read chapter 8, is to pay especially close attention to the story starter. Um, and as you read about that couple, consider this question again. What enables that couple uh, to survive and to thrive? Now, when I asked you yesterday to think about the elements of uh, a healthy or stable marriage, I told you that a couple of things were missing from your list, one of which we talked about yesterday at the end of class, which is prayer. The other one that I was looking for was the idea of sacrament. And so we spent the whole third quarter talking about sacraments and explaining how sacraments are ways in which we can uh, receive God's grace. This is going to be especially important for marriage because, as we'll discuss, being married is incredibly difficult. It's a lifelong commitment to give of yourself to another person, and that is by no means easy. Um, and so, like many of the other sacraments we talked about, it makes perfect sense that in the Catholic Church there is a sacrament that provides the grace needed to do just that. And that sacrament is called matrimony. Now we look at the nuts and bolts of marriage as a sacrament. Uh, there's a few things to be aware of. First of all, the ministers of matrimony uh, are not the priest or the deacon or whoever is um, observing the wedding on behalf of the church. The ministers of the, of the sacrament of matrimony are actually the bride and the groom. So they are simultaneously performing and receiving the sacrament. And the centerpiece of the marriage ceremony is the exchange of vows. That's really when a marriage becomes a marriage. So it's important to know what those vows are. Um, just to give you an idea of what this will look like in practice, uh, a wedding can take place either as part of a mass uh, with Eucharist following, or it can take place on its own. In that case, it would look much the same as a mass with liturgy of the word, and then the exchange of vows would take place after that. Um, but in any case, uh, whether it's part of a Mass or, or not part of a Mass, the priest or deacon who observes this exchange of vows um, will ask the couple, have you come here freely and without reservations to give yourselves to each other in marriage? Uh, of course, if you want to get married, you say yes. If you say no, I am forced to be here, uh, then you cannot have a valid marriage. The priest or deacon will also ask you then, will you love and honor each other as husband and wife for the rest of your lives? Again, if you say no, that this is a part-time deal or a, uh, you know, we're, we're going to love each other for 10 years or, or whatever, then you would not get married. So this is a vow of permanent faithfulness as long as the both of you live. And then a third question that he would ask, uh, and this is a necessary part of the Catholic wedding ceremony, he will ask, will you accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? Um, again, if you say, no, I don't like kids, uh, or no, we're not really open to children, then you will not get married in the Catholic church because part of the sacramentality of marriage is that life-giving nature of marital love. If you say yes to all three of these, then you will actively profess your vows. Uh, sometimes the priest or deacon will um, say it quietly and then you will repeat it. Other times he might uh, make you memorize it. There's a few different ways uh, of formatting the words here, but they all say the same thing. Um, so the uh, groom, for example, would say, I take you to be my wife. I will be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. And so once again, you see this total commitment. There is no um, reservation that's holding nothing back. And it's unconditional. It doesn't matter if it's um, good times, bad, um, you know, poverty, wealth, sickness, health. Regardless of what situations we encounter, I will be faithful to the promise I'm making right now. And so when you look at what these marriage vows are actually saying, they should sound pretty familiar because we've already talked about the qualities of Christ-like love and nuptial love, which are one and the same. 
essentially what you're saying is I love you and will always love you freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully. And this is why marriage is a sacrament, because this true nuptial love uh, possesses, as you can see, the same essential elements as God's love for us, Christ's love for his church. So when we experience marital love, we are experiencing the grace of God's love. And that's why when you look throughout the Bible, while there's many analogies used to try to describe God's love for his people, the spousal analogy is actually used more than any other. Um, that God is like the groom and his people is like the bride, that Christ is the groom and the church is uh, his bride. Now, one of the most misunderstood passages in the entire Bible um, that, you know, when it's listed in the readings at church, uh, I think a lot of times uh, men and women on the way home end up fighting over it if they're paying attention, is Ephesians chapter 5. But I think this passage also says a great deal about what true nuptial love consists of. Ephesians chapter 5 is the passage on mutual submission. And I would invite you to read that passage um, right now or as you uh, finish up this video. Um, but it's the passage that has the famous line that wives should be subordinate to their husbands. That's, of course, the line that garners all the attention. Unfortunately, however, I think we miss the lines that come before and after that line. Uh, before that line, it says that wives and husbands should be subordinate or submissive to one another. And we look at what the word submission or subordinate means. Uh, to be submissive means to place myself under the mission of someone else. Or to be subordinate means to place myself under the orders of someone else. So if the husband and the wife are placing themselves under the orders of the other, what are, the, what, what are those orders? What is that mission? Well, the mission of the spouses is to imitate the love of Christ for his church. And so what does Christ do for his church? Of course, he gives all of himself for his church. He dies for her church, for his church. And so after the uh, famed passage about wives should be submissive to their husbands, it also says husbands should love their wives the same way that Christ loves the church. Um, and so if anybody wants to point to that line to uh, suggest why husbands are superior, those husbands better be willing to die for their wives. And finally, the last topic that we're going to cover in this video is the role of sex within marriage. Uh, as you know, way back in the beginning of this part of the course, um, I said that your answer, your definition of chastity was not a good one because most of you define chastity simply as not having sex before marriage. Um, I said in order for that to make sense, we have to, of course, know like why there is that connection between sex and marriage. Um, we have to understand why it's not a great idea to participate in it before marriage. And I don't think you really understand that until you understand the blessing that sexual intercourse presents within marriage. So what does sex have to do with marriage? Well, if you go back to what we had covered the other day, what does sexual intercourse say? What message is conveyed? Of course, where we ended up was this idea that it says to the other person, I'm giving myself to you and receiving you freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully. And again, that should sound very familiar because we just discussed the wedding vows. And that's exactly what the wedding vows say. So when it comes down to it, sexual intercourse is actually a physical renewal of the wedding vows. You are saying with your body is the same thing that you said verbally on the altar. Now, one question that I want you to think about over the weekend and that we'll debate and discuss next week is the issue of contraception. Um, so given what you know about Catholic marriage and sacramental marriage, do you think that contraception would be a good fit for Catholic married couples.